Amen. The wonder of it all. The wonder of salvation. Good morning, everyone. It is great to have you in the house of the Lord today. We're going to go ahead and open with a word of prayer and go right into our music. Uh, Ken, for some reason, our words got really small on our screens. Are you able to adjust that? Oh, I did it. I don't think. I only hit the blank button. Let us go ahead and pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we can gather in this place to worship and exalt you. You are Almighty God, and you are worthy of all of our praise. You're worthy of glory and honor. Lord, I just think of all the angelic beings and the created beings of heaven that are continually worshiping you and giving you praise. And Lord, that is our desire today to just praise and to worship you. And uh, we just invite your presence into this place that you have your way. And we ask all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. If you are able to stand with us as we sing, this might be a new song to you, but it's very easy. As I journey through the land, singing as I go, pointing souls to Calvary, to the crimson flow, many arrows pierce my soul from without within, but my Lord leads me on, through him I must win, oh I want to see there to sing forever of his saving grace on the streets of glory let me lift my voice cares all past home and last ever to rejoice how many have ever sung that song before oh we got a few that's good i was the only one of the worship team that knew it so it's very easy and it's got a great message we want to see jesus when we get to heaven face to face amen amen Amen. Verse 2. When in service for my Lord, dark may be the night, but I'll cling more close to him, he will give me light. Satan's snares may vex my soul, turn my thoughts aside, but my Lord goes ahead, leads whate'er be tied. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving. Glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. When in valleys low I look toward the mountain high, and behold my Savior there leading in the fight. With a tender hand outstretched toward the valley low, guiding me, I can see as I onward go. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice, cares all past home at last ever to rejoice. When before me billows rise from the mighty deep, then my Lord directs my bark, he doth safely keep, and he leads me gently on through the world below. He's a real friend to me, oh, I love him so. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face, there to sing forever of his saving grace. On the streets of glory, let me lift my voice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Cares all past, home at last, ever to rejoice. Amen. And I just want to remind everyone that when in Scripture something is repeated three times, like holy, 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 that means it's the most holy to our Lord and Savior. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you, 
I want to see you, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high and up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 I want to see Holy, 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 I want to see you. Could we sing that holy, holy, those two slides again, Ken? Holy, 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 holy. I want to see you. Oh, he's holy. Oh, holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. I want to see you. Lord, you truly are holy. And Lord, we do want to see you. Lord, when we get to heaven, but, Lee, we, Lord, we want to experience you while we're here on this earth. Lord, we know that no one can look upon your holiness and live. But, Lord, we want to experience whatever you're willing to let us see. Just continue to bless this service, and we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Before you're seated, turn and greet one another this morning. Well, it's great to have everyone here in the house of the Lord. If you haven't done so, please silence your cell phones so we don't have any interruptions during the service. And if you're visiting with us, if you're a first-time visitor, there is a little card in the pocket in front of you. If you would take that out and fill it out. And when you exit these doors where the Welcome Center is after the service, uh, drop that off and we have a special gift for you to give give to you, and we are just so thrilled that you've decided to uh, join us this Sunday morning. Just pray that this, this service uh, will just bless you abundantly. If we can be of any service to you, please let pastor or someone here know, 
and we would be uh, love to serve you in whatever way we can. And other than that. Hey, good morning. It's great to worship the Lord this morning. I have a few announcements I want to highlight. They're in your bulletin. I think they're all in your bulletin, actually. Remember to keep Celebrate Recovery in prayer, and uh, that ministry kicked off last Tuesday with just a great, great, great kickoff. It's going to be meeting every Tuesday night at 630. For more information about that, see Plain Rock, or you could also see myself. You can just come out and check it out. Um, Celebrate Recovery. Ladies Love Connection will be meeting again February 11th, so that's a few weeks from now. That's in your bulletin as well. The other thing, and there's an insert about this, we do it every year, so it might be familiar to many of you, maybe not all of you, is we have this baby bottle boomerang again going on. Today's Sanctity of Life Sunday, and at Bethel, we believe life is sacred from conception until natural death, from the time the baby is conceived in the womb until God calls someone home, life is sacred. And we certainly believe that, and we like to support the Pregnancy Help Center, which actually two of us, myself and Bill Rotar, also are on the board for. And so we have baby bottles back there, and it's a a thing they do where you take that home, fill it up with change um, uh, or dollar bills or $100 bills, whatever, you name it, my, all money's money, and bring that back to the office, and we'll get it back to the Pregnancy Help Center. We set a target end date for that for uh, the first Sunday of February, of March, March 5th. So you have some time. The, in, the insert in your bulletin talks about a way to virtually do that. You can virtually fill up a bottle, too. That information's in your bulletin, and if you have questions, you can ask me. Or you could also check out their website or call the Pregnancy Help Center. But that's going on as well. Everything in your bulletin is um, a very gracious, very kind thank you from Elaine Carlson. We recognized her last week, her many years of service with a luncheon. And you can see, um, we can't let her go too quickly. She's back on the piano today, which is a reminder uh, we're still looking for a pianist. So if you know someone, we're advertising in various ways. But if you know someone, uh, spread the word, let me know. Uh, we're still looking for a pianist. Uh, I have a couple other announcements. And one is that we still need some sign-ups for nursery. We're still looking for a, at least a couple more volunteers for nursery so we can have a good rotation for nursery. And if you have questions about that, you can see Tammy Bear or you can see me. But one thing we're going to do, we've done this before. You know, I know that uh, as soon as, you know, you access sanctuary, you're socializing, you know, you're fellowshipping, which is great. And sometimes, you know, the sign-up sheets get missed. So we're going to pass around the sign-up sheet, starting in this corner with Tammy. And if that you think that might be a ministry that God stayed in your heart to help in, once a month. You know, we're looking to get someone who can help in nursery. Once a month, sign up on the sign-up sheet. If you have questions about it, you, you know, definitely see me or see Tammy Bear. Did you have anything else you want to say about that or? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Name, and for those who didn't hear that, phone number. We need a contact number, too, and we'd like to get a good schedule going for that. So those are all the announcements that I wanted to specify. And so right now, at this point, I want to go to the Lord in prayer, and I just want to do a couple prayer updates uh, one is that Don Phillips is doing a little better, and, we're, and they're grateful for uh, prayers and support, but we'll keep praying for Don as he continues to recover from that shoulder surgery a few months uh, back in December. And uh, continue to keep uh, Bill Rotar in prayer. He's coming along. His strength is coming back. His, his attitude is really good. He's at Briarfield. Uh, keep praying for his taste to improve, though. But he is gaining some weight back, and he is eating, but... Um, Last I talked to him, the taste still hadn't totally recovered. Is that last, do you have any more updates on that, Judy? Same. Just keep praying that his taste buds recover and pray for Bill. As you most of you probably know, Cindy Wells went home to be with the Lord last Wednesday morning. So she's worshiping the Lord in heaven today, which is just awesome and glorious and amazing. And the, the service, memorial service for Cindy is not going to be immediate. That's going to be the first Saturday of March, which I think is March 3rd, so... Um, you can keep Cindy Wells' family in prayer. Any other prayer requests or updates that I missed that you would like to share before we go to prayer? Okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time. Heavenly Father, we come to you in prayer as I think about that beautiful song. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. 
I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. As it goes on to say, we cry out, holy, holy, holy. So scriptural, Lord. As I'm reminded of Isaiah serving in your service in the temple. As he sees the Lord seated on his throne, high and exalted. The train of his robe just filled the place. And he saw the seraphim, the angels, circling, six wings, crying out. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Lord God, as I think of Revelation 6 and actually Revelation 4 and 5 and 7. Again, holy, 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 most holy, holiest. Lord God, we know that you are most holy. There is no one more powerful or amazing or awesome or holy, set apart, sacred, revered than you. And how awesome is that is, Lord God, because if there was anyone greater than you, we would want to pray to the one greater. We'd want to go to the boss. But Lord God, we know that you are the boss. You are the greatest. There is no one more powerful. And you're unchanging, and you don't lie. And, and so when your word tells us we're saved, we're made like new, we'll be resurrected. We can trust in the promises of God. We can trust that you have the, the power to do it, that you're faithful. Oh, Lord God, thank you. You are faithful. And we can know you. So we worship you. We exalt you. We come to you with the various needs. But first and foremost, we come to you with worship. We come to you crying out worthy. You are worthy, Lord God. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our adoration. Oh, Lord God, I pray that you remind us of that today. Remind us that we're not here to thank an employer. We're not here to thank a government official. We're not here to, to praise a actor or actress or athlete or somebody else that we put on a pedestal or even a rich uncle or benefactor. We're here to praise the almighty God. We're here to worship the almighty God. We're here to worship uh, the, the, the creator of the heavens and the earth. We're here to worship our savior who died in our place, restoring us to a right relationship with God almighty. We're here to worship the one, capital O, in which there is no comparison. There's no, no one who would compare to who you are. Certainly we're creating the image of God, and we say that kind of loosely, Lord. You are so amazing. Your power, your strength, your knowledge, your omnipresentness, so amazing. And yet you love us. You love us. You care for us. Remind us of those awesome truths as we worship you, as we continue to worship you. And because of certainly, Lord God, those awesome truths that you're all powerful and you're present everywhere, even outside of time, and you're all knowing and, and you love us, you love us, Lord, you love us. Because of those awesome truths, we come to you and we, and we pray for our needs. You know all the needs. We, we pray for uh, those fighting cancer. Those recovering from open heart surgery. I mentioned Bill Rotar, re healing his taste buds. We come to you for the, the many, many, many other needs. Those dealing with the loss of a loved one. Those dealing with anxiety or, or depression or, or, or needing a new job or whatever it might be. You know them all and we come to you and we say, help, for we know that you can help. We know that you can help. Help us, Lord God, as we continue through life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups, life's trials, life's troubles, life's hardships. And remind us, Lord God, of your great love for us. Lord God, we dedicate today's offering to you. Take it, use it for your glory and your purposes. Be with all the needs mentioned and all those not mentioned, all the unspoken requests, all those that we haven't even shared. Help us with our needs. 
and with the greatest need of all is spiritual, Lord. Help us to trust in you as our Lord and Savior, repenting of our sins, believing that you died on the cross for our sins and rose again, trusting in you. And then, not just as a one-time commitment to you, help us every single day to strive to commit to live for you, to live for you, to make you our Lord and Savior, to surrender to you. But no, we're not doing it on our own. You're helping us through the Holy Spirit within us. Lord God, we continue to worship you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Knowing Jesus, there is no greater thing than to know Jesus. There's many people around the world that know of Jesus, but there's no greater thing to know Jesus, to have that personal relationship with him. And if you're able to stand with us as we sing this. can do nothing without you according to your living word. We need to be connected with you each and every day of our life. From the time we wake up to the time we go to bed. And you even watch over us as we sleep. Lord, we need you more than ever before do we need you. Lord, continue to bless this service. Bless each one here. Lord, you know what we have need of. 
And I pray today that you would meet that need, whatever we might be searching for. And we ask it in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. I made it. I'm in heaven. Oh, look at this place. It's beautiful. Singing in the rain. Just think that I could be here in, in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay, I'm bored. What am I going to do forever and ever and ever? Oh, look, there's someone that can help. Hi. Hi, how can I help you? I wonder if you could answer a few questions. Yes, that's why I'm here. Information. Well, I'm glad to be here too, Ann. We're glad you're here too. Thank you, but I have a question. What's there to do here? Lots of people ask that. What do you, what do you like? Do you like sports? Oh, I love sports. Good. Do you play baseball? Football, basketball, and both. Four. Well, that's awesome. That'll take up a lot of time. What else? Let's see. Where else do we have? Rock and roll? You have rock and roll here? They're all here? Uh, no. But the spirit of them is. For <laughs> some reason. I see. Cool. What else? Food. Do you like food? Oh, I love food. Yummy. Lots of great food. Great food. I can't wait. I can eat and eat and eat and not gain weight. Amusement park? You have roller coasters in heaven? Heaven? This isn't heaven. You mean this isn't heaven? You mean this is... Yes, you're in Cleveland! <laughs> you must have fallen asleep on a train or something. Here's your invitation to time slip on all the time. Have a great time while you're in Cleveland! <laughs> hey! What time does the Rock and Roll Museum close? Oh, you did. I got it. Thank you. My thanks to the uh, those in the skits and others, we got more skits we're working on. And if any of you want to be in a skit and you're not in one yet, you can see Lynn Roboski about the skits. We're doing, we're having about one a month. And obviously that was focused on heaven and with more of a com comedy focus. Uh, today, you know, I'm, children is Mr. Junior Church, by the way. If uh, young kids can make their way to Junior Church at this time. And clearly found himself wandering whether, wondering whether there were any golf courses in heaven. I guess he was kind of like, you know, Rich's place in that skit, you know. 
You can have all these great things in heaven. He was wondering whether any golf course is in heaven. So he began ask, asking the question in his prayers. And one day, in answer to his prayers, he received a direct answer from on high. He received a direct answer on high about whether there are golf courses in heaven. Yes, said the heavenly messenger. There are many excellent golf courses in heaven. The greens are always in first class condition, first class condition. The weather is always perfect and you always get to play with the very nicest people. Oh, thank you, said the cleric. That really is marvelous news. Yes, isn't it, replied this heavenly messenger. And we've got you down for a foursome next Saturday. We're in this sermon series on heaven. I started it two Sundays ago. This is the third Sunday's uh, message on heaven, which will go through February. And then in March, we're going to start a sermon series. I'm titling God Loves You, God Loves You, which is true. Uh, I want to remind you of the homework assignment I gave you two weeks ago. I'm sure that if I asked you as you exited the door, you would all remember exactly what the homework assignment was. But I'll remind you. I asked you to take to just think about, you know, any uh, questions about heaven that just are just burning with inside, with, within you. That, and then at the last Sunday, the last sermon that I give on heaven, if I haven't tried to answer them, we can't answer everything, but if I, you know, I don't, they mentioned, you know, Elvis and Jimi Hendrix in heaven, I can't answer those questions, okay? But if it's something that I think the Bible can give a little bit of an answer to, I won't try on the last Sunday of this series, which will be February 26th, I think. So, just keep in mind that. Submit questions, you know, that you might have. You can email them to the office. You can call, you know, things like that. A few years ago, I was running with Mercedes, and and we had an interesting conversation. And we've had many different, different interesting conversations while running. She took a stab at running herself last year and actually ran, like literally ran with me. But at this time, this was about seven or eight years ago, and she was in a jogging stroller that I would push her in as, as, as we would run together. And, and as we were jogging, <clears throat> she would just ask different things, you know. At one point, we were running by a graveyard at a park, and, and she said, uh, you know, something about the graveyard. And she said, uh, you, get a, you, get, you get a special pass to heaven because you're a pastor, right, Daddy? And I said, no, 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 no. Don't get any special privileges. It's all by faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. But on this particular drive, uh, on this particular run, drive would be easier. On this particular run, while well, running, pushing her in the stroller, she said, Daddy, do we have to go to the bathroom in heaven? That's one of the questions you can submit, and I really cannot accurately answer that. I just cannot answer that. Now, she asked that question when she was about five years old. Now, she's 11 now. I don't know if she's still thinking about that. But for those who have been around five years old, you know that that's, you know, getting to the bathroom in time is a big responsibility, a big burden for a five-year-old. When I was a kid, I asked all kinds of questions about heaven. I always wanted to know, I still actually want to know, if there is peanut butter pie in heaven. I I love peanut butter pie or chocolate pie. Anything sweet, I just like it. But I also like the steak and potatoes. But, uh, you know, we want to know those things. But why don't we think like children about heaven anymore? Oh, thank you, Megan. Why don't we think like children about heaven anymore? Why don't we use our imagination? Now, we might call that sanctified imagination. In, in, in church circles, oftentimes we, we call it sanctified imagination. Because in, in Christ, as we know Christ, if Jesus is our Lord and Savior, as we grow in our faith, as we grow in our faith in Jesus, as we grow in our relationship with Jesus, Jesus is making us more like him. We call that sanctification. Whenever, we use, whenever I use words like that, I want to define them. Sanctification is the process of growing to become more like Jesus. And as we learn more of the scriptures... So under the Bible's guidance, we can think and think maybe since there's a city in heaven, maybe there's going to be fun things to do. Maybe since there's a vineyard in heaven, maybe that means there's going to be juice, grape juice, I don't, apples, you know, whatever. You know, maybe that means there's going to be food. Sanctified imagination. Why don't we think like that anymore? Heaven's going to be amazing. Which leads to, to the, the sermon today, which is, will heaven be boring? Will heaven be boring? 
or will we be able to have a bunch of fun, like in that skit that was shared? Will we be able to play golf if that's what you like to do, or go jogging if that's what you like to do, or baseball, or football, or basketball, or, or read and learn? There's going to be a sermon in a few weeks about learning in heaven. Will we be able to do all those fun things in addition to worshiping the Lord? We're certainly going to be worshiping the Lord. And the most important, most exciting thing about heaven is we will be with Jesus. Never forget that. I think I shared it a couple weeks ago, and it bears repeating right now. A uh, movie, I haven't seen it, based on a book, which I haven't read, but it's called Five People You'll Meet in Heaven. And from what I understand, you can correct me if you've read it or seen it on your way out the door if I'm wrong. From what I understand, none of the people in that book are Jesus. Don't miss the main thing, which is Jesus. <laughs> It's all about Jesus. Our Christian life has to be all about Jesus. Heaven is all about Jesus. And because of Jesus' love for us, it's going to be so great, so amazing. By the way, I should give a little disclaimer for this Heaven series. As I continue to preach on Heaven, and I talk about the greatness of Heaven, never forget living with Jesus now. John 10.10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy Jesus comes to give us life abundantly, fullness of life. Heaven is going to be amazing, but we're also living for God's kingdom now. And we have to, you know, wait until God in his natural timing calls us home to heaven. A common misconception about eternity surfaced in an episode of Star Trek Voyager. There was a Star Trek uh, series called Voyager. It came out in the 90s, and I'm sure you've all seen it because you're all sci-fi people kidding, I'm kidding. But anyways, in this particular episode, there was a member of the undying Q continuum. In Star Trek, they had this Q continuum, and they never died, and they had all these different powers. And this person from the undying Q continuum was longing for his end to his existence. He was longing for an end to his existence. His life was never ending. And he was all actually envious of humanity because they had an end to their existence. Why was he longing for an end to his, his existence? Because, he complains, everything that could be said and done has already been said and done. And now there's only repetition and utter boredom. He thought everything that said and could be said and done has been done. There's only repetition now and utter boredom. He says, for us, the disease is immortality. And so finally, he was allowed to end his existence. That is not what heaven's going to be like. Christians can have fun. Heaven is going to be so much greater and more amazing than we can even think or imagine. By the way, here in just a moment, we're going to go to Isaiah 66, no, Isaiah 65, if you want to start to turn there. I'm going to go to some other passages. Isaiah is like in the middle of your Bible, and I'm going to go to some other passages too, because as I shared at the beginning of this series, that to talk about heaven, I have to look at various passages from all throughout the Bible to find out what does the Bible say about heaven. Many times, though we believe if we are in Christ, that's where we are going for all eternity, we don't think about it much. We don't study it much. A few years ago, someone whose wife had died tried to argue with me and tell me, the Bible doesn't say anything about heaven. That is not true. The Bible says a lot about heaven. And maybe if we focus more on what the Bible teaches about heaven, maybe... We'd be more happy about our faith and how awesome Jesus is. My theme today is heaven will not be boring. Heaven will be fun. Heaven will have all the blessings of this life without the hardships, pain, and suffering. Heaven will be Jesus. Heaven will not be boring. I'm going to repeat that. Heaven will not be boring. Heaven will be fun. Heaven will have all the blessings of this life without the hardships, pain, and suffering. Heaven will be with Jesus. I took it out of my sermon. It was originally in there. Um, so just in case you wonder, yes, I do cut my sermon shorter sometimes. I took it out, but there was an illustration from Little House in the Big Woods. It's a Laura Ingalls Wilder classic. Little House in the Big Woods where they were playing around on a Sunday, and they weren't allowed to play around on a Sunday, not back then in the 1870s, and 
Big Woods, Wisconsin, they weren't allowed to play around on Sundays. And so, Pa, Charles Ingalls, not Michael Landon, the real Charles Ingalls. Uh, pa called her, the girls over and had him sit on their, his knee and said, I got a story for you. And told a story about when his father, the grandpa, was a kid. You really couldn't play on Sundays then. See, even back then they talked about how times were changing. You really couldn't have fun on Sundays then. He told a story about how the great-grandfather was reading the Bible to them Sunday afternoon. And they were all supposed to just sit so quietly and listen to the Bible. They couldn't say anything, even though they were like five, six, seven years old. They couldn't say anything. They just had to listen as the grandpa read the Bible. Well, grandpa fell asleep. So they snuck out and went sledding and came back in. And grandpa, if I recall, was awake and they were punished. And the reason I had that originally in my sermon, and I just summarized it so it's still shorter, is sometimes we make Christianity so boring, and I don't think God wants us to make Christianity boring. Certainly there is discipline. Certainly we want to focus on the Lord when we come to worship him, you know, things like that. But, I, you know, God gives us joy, excitement, games, the ability to play. He gives us those things for this life and for all eternity. What will we do in heaven? We will worship the triune God. We will rule and administrate. We will, we will have different positions of authority. We can trace all these back to Scripture, by the way. We will have different positions of authority. We may, we may rebuild cities. We, we may build homes. Some will compose and write music. We see music in the intermediate heaven. Some will play musical instruments. We will serve. Some will farm. We see farms listed in heaven. Some will cultivate orchards. It seems that heaven is a reflection, a reflection, or, or, or actually, I should say this earth is a reflection of how heaven was meant to be. This earth is a reflection of how heaven was meant to be. God created the Garden of Eden, placed Adam and Eve in it. It actually says God put Adam in the garden. That's before sin entered the world. So I think the new heavens and new earth are going to be like the Garden of Eden was meant to be, only so much better. And without sin and all the, all the bad effects of sin, things God created that have been distorted by sin will be made right and perfect. Get this. This is very important. We live in a fallen world. We see evidence of that every single day. We live in a fallen world, but I believe the Bible shows that heaven will be as God intended the Garden of Eden to be before sin entered the world. Do you ever just go out <clears throat> hiking or walking or looking at landscapes and you just see just this beautiful, beautiful scene? When you do, realize it's beautiful now. It's gonna be, but, but yet now it's distorted by a fallen, depraved world. Someday, it's going to be so much more awesome, so much more amazing, so much even better. We can read Revelation 21 and 22. That's the last book of the Bible, last two chapters. We can read those, and we can see the comparisons with the Garden of Eden. In the eternal heaven, in Revelation 22, it seems that that, that heaven reflects the first Garden of Eden. Get this. We see a tree of life. Again in verse 2, Revelation 22, verse 2. As there was a tree of life in the first Garden of Eden in Genesis 2.9. We see a river in the eternal heaven in Revelation 22.1. We see two rivers in the Garden of Eden in Genesis 2 verse 10 and 13. It does seem that the eternal new Jerusalem heaven is going to be like the Garden of Eden was meant to be only much better. Only much better. We have purpose now and we will have purpose for all eternity. Just think for a moment about your best moments on earth. Think about your most exciting times. Think about how you felt when you first found out you were going to be a dad or a mom. Think about how you felt when you were first engaged or newly married. How exciting was that? Or maybe even be a grandparent. How exciting was that? Think about the joy uh, comfort and excitement on a vacation. Just think about how excited you were to get a new job or do a certain job. Just think for a moment about how much you love a certain hobby. Now imagine that joy. Imagine that joy. Those feelings, that excitement going on for all 
eternity. Right? We have certain joy. We have certain excitement now. But then life hits us back in the face, right? Then you realize you got to go back to work. You realize, you know, life goes on. Maybe even in your mind, something that's stressing you comes to mind. Not in heaven. Not in heaven. It'll be never ending. Imagine for all eternity doing what you just love to do, but without being tired, without sickness or pain. And I wouldn't limit eternity. You may get bored fishing for all eternity. I'm just making up things that people love to do. Well, guess what? You can do something else. I think we'll be able to work. But it won't be tiring. It won't be a burden. It does seem that we will have purpose. I want to read Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. And then I'm going to pull from other verses for this, for this message. Isaiah 65, 17 through 25. This passage is a blend. It's kind of a merger, a conflation of the, of the millennial reign of Christ with the new heavens and new earth. And I'm going to give more description of that here in a minute. God says here in verse 17, Isaiah 65, 17. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. And the former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem to be a joy and her people to be a gladness. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. No more shall be heard in it the sound of weeping and the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant who lives but a few days. Or an old man who does not fill out his days. For the young man shall die a hundred years old. And the sinner, a hundred years old, shall be accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be. And my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain or build children for calamity. For for, For they shall be the offspring of the blessed of the Lord. And their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall graze together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, and dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. They shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountains, says the Lord. I just repeated that in. Notice that. Before they call, God says he will answer. While they are yet speaking... God will hear. There's going to be that close, physical, intimate relationship with the Lord. Notice it says the wolf and the lamb shall graze together. In other words, the wolf is not going to be a threat to the lamb. The lion's going to eat straw like an ox. I don't, you know, some of this language is poetic. It may not mean the lion's going to literally eat straw. Maybe, uh, well, another sermon will be if animals are in heaven. That's next week. If you want to know about pets in heaven, you can come back next Sunday. Come back next Sunday either way. But it just means that the lion, you know, is, going to, is not going to need to kill other animals or human beings to, to live. Notice it says, dust shall be the serpent's food. It means you don't have to worry about the serpent. There's another passage where it says the child can play by the, the hole of the cobra. You know, there's not going to be a threat that, of, of cobras, uh, of snakes. Isaiah 65, 17, God says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. Former things shall not be remembered or come into mind. This is likely just an expression. Actually, I would say this is definitely just an expression. This does not mean we're not going to have memory. He's, he's just saying, you know, we, we will, we're not going to be dwelling on negative, bad memories, you know, things like that. Verse 18 references Jerusalem. Verse 19 talks about God rejoicing in Jerusalem and God being glad with his people. There will, there will not be any more weeping. Verse 20 is interesting. On one hand, it says there will be infants. But then it says people will live very long. An infant will not, will not only live a few days. It says, even the person who dies 100 will be thought accursed. Now, we read that and we think, why is it talking about death? Now, notice it's talking about living very, 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 very long. But why is it referencing death? And as I said, this is blending the millennial reign of Jesus with the new heaven and new earth. And that's why we best interpret scripture by correlating, by cross-referencing, by going to Revelation 21 and 22 to find more, by going to other passages. So in the millennial reign, there are different interpretive guidelines there, but in the millennial reign, 
it seems that people will live very, very, very long. But those that enter the millennial reign after the tribulation period who have not died yet will eventually die in the millennial reign. But in the new heaven and new earth, there will be no death. So it's a, it's a blending together. If you want the technical word to impress people with later on, it's called a merism. A merism. A merism is the blending idea, blending of the new heavens with the millennial reign together. It's a figure of speech taking two extremes, like I search night and day. It's blending things together. So we can conclude that Isaiah is writing about both. The millennial reign of Jesus, which we see in Revelation 19, again, by the way, the, actually Revelation 20, Revelation 20, the millennial 1,000-year reign of Jesus where he's reigning over Jerusalem, and you have that time period, and then it merges into the new heaven and new earth, which is in Revelation 21 and 22, and is the final, never-ending heaven. But they are both in a renovated state. Isaiah 65, 21 through 22 references houses and inhabiting them, as well as vineyards and the eating of the fruit. So now we see houses. We see fruit. Isaiah 65, 23 references labor and bearing of children. Now I think the bearing of children side is probably more likely in the millennial reign. Mixing Isaiah 65 with Revelation 22 shows the details of a city and a garden alongside the details of a vineyard. Let's put this in context, the context of the Bible. Isaiah is oftentimes called the fifth gospel, the fifth gospel. Isaiah prophesied about the future Israel, and he prophesied. Isaiah prophesied destruction. But then in Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 50, Isaiah 52, 13 through 53, 12, we have the four servant songs. You might have heard about those because those are about the ultimate suffering servant, Jesus. So in the beginning of Isaiah, Isaiah chapters 1 through 39, Isaiah is prophesying Israel has been unfaithful and they're going to be conquered. And then Isaiah transitions and starts to prophesy hope. The suffering servant's going to come. Jesus is going to come. Isaiah 53 is just striking about Jesus, the Messiah, and the suffering that Jesus would go through. It's all about Jesus. We, we see the suffering Jesus would go through. Then, Isaiah chapters 56 through 66 are prophesies about the future times until the end. So why does this fall? Why does this fall? Why does this passage in Isaiah 65 fall where it does? Because Isaiah is transitioning to hope. He's talking about hope. He's talking about the future times until the end. Isaiah 65 even anticipates the spread of the gospel in Acts. And then this passage. This passage is looking towards the ultimate hope. Heaven. He's going from this time period. He's going from this time period where Jesus comes, a suffering servant, to the spread of the gospel in the book of Acts, and then to heaven. This is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. When we talk about heaven, this is all about Jesus. Randy Alcorn writes this. Randy Alcorn writes this in his book titled Heaven. He says, Isaiah 65, 21 suggests that we'll build houses and live in them on the new earth. That part, Randy Alcorn believes, is not the millennial reign, but the new earth, the new heavens and the new earth. If so, we'll no doubt decorate them beautifully. Buildings on the scale of the new Jerusalem reflect extensive cultural advancement. Human builders were learned from God's design, just as Leonardo da Vinci learned by studying the form and flight of birds while working on his flying machine. What will clear-thinking human beings, unhindered by sin and the barriers that separate us, be able to design and build? What would Galileo, da Vinci, Edison, or Einstein achieve if they could live even a thousand years unhindered by the curse? What will we achieve when we have resurrected bodies with resurrected minds working together forever? It's quite likely people will continue to compose music write stories, discover things. Suppose people continue to explore, but now they can explore all these new oceans. Suppose people can explore outer space and go even further than before. A major point to be made, and do not forget this, is 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is the past to chapter about the resurrection. If we have resurrected, perfect, restored bodies, what will we be able to do? That'll be amazing. Jesus walked through walls. 
Will we be able to walk through walls, or was that just because Jesus is God? It's possible. Jesus also ascended to heaven, wasn't limited by gravity. Is that the case for us, or just because Jesus is God? The Bible does not give any indication. The Bible does not give any indication of a disembodied, boring state. On the contrary, the Bible shows an embodied existence in a real place of activity in heaven. And if we start to say things like, no, it's just disembodied floating on, this, on the clouds, that is totally the opposite of what the Bible teaches about heaven. Heaven will not be boring. Here's another passage, Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion. Again, this is Hebrews 12, 22 through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion, into the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels, in feastal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. The new heaven and new earth will not be boring. The greatest reason heaven will not be boring is because we will be with Jesus. But get this, we will also be with others who have gone on before us. Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. This is about Jesus. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's about our relationship with Jesus now. And I believe it connects with our relationship with Jesus for all eternity. We're going to be in our resurrected, perfect bodies. In a resurrected, perfect new heaven and new earth. With other resurrected, perfect human beings with our amazing Savior, and it will not be boring. Let's apply this. In the last book of the Bible, in Revelation 14, verse 13, John writes, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds will follow them. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors. Rest. But he also says their deeds will follow them. Their deeds will follow them. What we do on earth will follow us. So it's best that we store up treasures in heaven now. Now, entrance into heaven is a free gift given by Jesus. We receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. We receive him as Lord and Savior. Not as just saying I'm a fan of Jesus, but I'm not going to get that fanatical. No, we receive him as Lord and Savior. And it's a free gift of salvation. But God does remember the good things that we do. Hebrews 6.10 tells us that God will not forget the good things we do. We can look forward to heaven. Heaven will be greater than anything we can imagine. We can share the gospel knowing that we are inviting others to paradise. We can also know that if we have extra suffering here and now, We won't have that for eternity. We will not have that for eternity. Some of us would love to do certain things, but can't because of health. Some of us would love to be able to play your favorite games and other things. You will be able to in heaven. You can do all that and more in heaven. If you can't run anymore, if you can't play certain games anymore, play with your grandchildren, whatever, you're going to be restored in heaven. In heaven, you will be able to have all the energy that you can dream of, probably. But not be omnipotent. You won't be God. I'm amazed by the energy of children. They can move just so fast. I'm amazed at my young age, how much my energy goes and my knees hurt after a jog and things like that. And just think about heaven not having to deal with that. I've always been more cognizant of that. Uh, Because with multiple sclerosis, which my wife Megan has, you know, fatigue is such a common thing with MS. Getting to sleep, getting to try and to encourage her and to take naps during the afternoon. Anytime you talk to anybody with MS, they're talking about balance. They talk about uh, energy level. Sometimes they're talking about double vision, which Megan has had. They talk about eyesight issues, which in 2014, there was about three months where Megan's eyesight almost went. She was legally blind and uh, had to, couldn't drive and things like that. Won't have that in heaven. It's funny, when Megan was pregnant with Mercedes, we were seeing a midwife at the 
doctor's office, and I was asking about the fatigue and giving birth and things like that, you know, because I was thinking about the fatigue she deals with, and then you think of 23 hours of labor and things like that. And the midwife said, uh, don't worry, women have been having babies for thousands of years. And I was thinking, yeah, they've died having babies for thousands of years too. But anyways, God provided and things have been okay. In heaven, we will not deal with the fatigue. You won't deal with those types of things. However, our experience in heaven is determined by our faithfulness to Christ now. We are saved by grace, but we will have rewards for faithfully serving Jesus now. So just like how in this life the mistakes we make now can catch up to us later, right? They talk about don't burn bridges, you know, things like that. Things catch up to us. Our lack of faithfulness to Jesus will determine certain things that we might enjoy in heaven. You know, there's a passage in 1 Corinthians 3 where Paul writes, they may get to heaven narrowly escaping the flames of fire. Do you want to get to heaven just barely making it in? Or do you want to make Jesus your, not just Savior, but Lord now? Do you want to live with him now? I know a pastor who, um, another evangelical friend's pastor is retired now, who says, you know, for those that don't want to serve Jesus now and live with him now, the most gracious thing for God to do is not send them to heaven. And that's where hell comes in. Don't trifle with your eternal life in Jesus Live for him now. Live with him now. Live in a relationship with him now. Make him your Lord and Savior now. We must know him. God came to earth and took on flesh. He lived the life we could not live and died the death we could not die. And he did this for his glory and he did this to welcome us into heaven. These passages that we talk about heaven, they're all about Jesus. Is he your Lord and Savior? 2 Peter 3, 9. Peter says, God desires a relationship with everyone. That's my paraphrase. You know, people were wondering, Peter, why, haven't, why hasn't Jesus come back again? Why hasn't he come back? Why, what's he waiting for? When's he going to restore all things? When he's, when's he going to bring about the millennial reign and new heaven and new earth? And, and Peter says, wait a second. God's waiting so that more can come to know him as Lord and Savior. God's waiting for us to spread the gospel. And I want to ask you, are you spreading the gospel? If you know Jesus, are you sharing Jesus with other people? If you know Jesus, are you living for him and are you sharing him with others? In the front of your bulletin, for the last three weeks, we've had this year's vision for Bethel. We desire to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference. We desire to know God To know God, that means the lost get saved. We want to know God. We want to have a relationship with God. And we want to to spread the gospel to other people. Share the gospel. Are you sharing the gospel? I've said before, we're evangelical, but not really. Because evangelical should mean we know Jesus and we share Jesus. And if we don't share Jesus and we don't care about Jesus, we probably don't know Jesus. Because if we knew Jesus and really knew about the awesome promises of fullness of life that Jesus offers and the awesome promises of heaven, we would not hold that inside. We'd share it with others. Do you know Jesus? And are you sharing Jesus? We desire to know God. We desire to find freedom. That's, that's pastoring people. We want to make sure that we are pastoring, leading, shepherding the flock. We want to discover purpose. That's discipleship, growing in our relationship with Jesus. We desire to make a difference. Know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. I heard something last week. It's just a little cliche almost, but it doesn't have to be a cliche. Each one, each one reach one. Each one reach one. Another pastor told me he would challenge his church, each one reach one. And that's a challenge. I thought, that's good. I want to repeat that. Can you concentrate on who you could invite to the gospel, either sharing the gospel with somebody, talking about Jesus with somebody this year? Try for one. Or maybe each one, reach one, invite them to Sunday morning worship. Statistics always show that if we invite people to church, they'll come usually. Maybe you don't want to invite them to church. Maybe you tried that. That didn't work. Invite them to celebrate recovery. Invite them to men's breakfast. Invite him to one of the women's ladies' love connections. Invite him to a small group Bible study. Invite him to something else. 
Maybe you're sitting there and you say, all my friends and family, they know about my faith in Christ. Well, then you need to be more missional. You need to find new relationships. You need to get outside the box. You need to join a new club. When I was in college at Cedarville University, Cedarville had this great athletic complex and everything, but I had professors who would not work out there. They would go work out somewhere else so they could rub shoulders with non-believers, so they could be missionaries. Everyone, if you, are, if you are here and you know Jesus is Lord and Savior and Jesus is your Lord and Savior, you are called to be a missionary. Every one of us, we are all called to share that faith with others. We are all part of the Lord's army. We are all called to be missionaries. So just think about it. Each one reach one. Think about it. And, and, and start with prayer. Start with prayer. Praying, Lord Jesus, brighten my eyes. Show me someone today to talk about my faith with. I'm amazed. You know, we start Celebrate Recovery last Tuesday. We got it again this week and every single week after that. You know, some of you have relatives, friends, family, others. I, I can't guarantee this because statistics back this up. Dealing with alcohol, drug abuse, or maybe something else. Maybe it's depression. Maybe it's anxiety. And maybe it's your relative. Invite them and say, I will go to Celebrate Recovery with you. I... Come, I will, bring, I will pick you up at 6.15, and we'll go there, and we will go together. And by the way, every one of us has a hurt, have it, or hang up we're dealing with. We all have things we're dealing with until we get to heaven and be with Jesus. And then everything's going to be made new, and there will be nothing like that at all. Everything will be made right. Heaven, and this heaven series, is contingent on knowing Jesus. So I challenge you, do you know Jesus and then I challenge you, are you sharing Jesus with others? I love how C.S. Lewis's profound perspective in his book, Mere Christianity, I love how he writes this. He says, the Christian says, creatures are not born with desires unless satisfaction for those desires exists. A baby feels hunger. Well, there is such a thing as food. A duckling wants to swim. Well, there is such a thing as water. Men feel sexual, sexual uh, desire. Well, there's such a thing as sex. If I find, C.S. Lewis continues, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. If none of my earthly pleasures satisfy it, that does not prove that the universe is a fraud. Probably earthly pleasures were never meant to satisfy it, but only to arouse it to suggest the real thing. If that is so, I must take care, on the one hand, never to despise or to be unthankful for these earthly blessings. On the other, never to mistake them for the, for, for the something else, of which they are only a kind of copy or echo or mirage. I must keep alive in myself the desire for my true country, which I shall not find till after death. I must never let it get snowed under or turned aside. I must make it the main object of life to press on to that country and help others to do the same. And our true country, our true desire, is ultimately being restored with Jesus in heaven. We are created for eternity. We are created for heaven. And it will not be boring. Heaven will be fun. Heaven will have all the blessings of this life without the hardships, pain, and suffering. And heaven will be with Jesus. Live with Jesus in your relationship now. Let me pray as we close. Lord God, I pray that we do live with you. We do serve you. We do follow you. We are committed to you now. And Lord God, for anyone that, uh, here listening, uh, maybe convicted. They haven't been living for you. They've been a fan in the stands, and you're calling them to get on the playing field and make you Lord of their life. May today be the day. It's never too late. May today be the day to repent. And say, Lord Jesus, I want to make you my Savior and my Lord. I want to receive you as Lord. I've not been committed to you, but I'm going to be committed to you today for the rest of my life. And Jesus, we know that you honor their prayer. You honor their prayer. Lord God, please bless and guide us as we go. Lord God, we cannot live the Christian life without you. We live it with you, with the Holy Spirit inside of us. Help us in Jesus' name, amen. As we close in prayer, if God has laid anything in your heart, always, the altars are open, and we have people up here to pray with you. They would love to just pray with you right now. If you're able to stand with us as we sing, turn your eyes upon Jesus.
Guide us as we go, in your name. 